Well, thank you for the wonderful introduction. I'm very pleased to share with you today a little bit on the SPRI pathogen screening platforms we have been developing in our research group. Here is an outline of my presentation today. I'll start off with a brief introduction to the SPRI technology and relate how SPRI can be a useful tool for pathogen screening in the food safety sector. Then I'll provide examples of how we developed an SPRI method for detecting salmonella and another example of simultaneous screening of two pathogens from chicken rinse, which is a very common matrix in poultry product safety screening. Surface plasma resonance, or SPR, is an optical phenomenon that occurs at metal dielectric interfaces. Basically, when a polarized light hits a prism covered by a thin metal film at a certain angle, the incident photons can be absorbed by the metal film by resonating with its free electron oscillation. This is shown as a dramatically decreased intensity in the reflected light, and the corresponding incident light angle is called the SPR angle. Since the electromagnetic wave is on the boundary of the metal film and the dielectric, it's very sensitive to any changes of this boundary, such as absorption of molecules onto the surface. So these subtle changes can cause the SPR angle to shift, which can be detected by measuring the reflected light intensity at the other side of the prism. The SPR phenomenon allows us to monitor molecular interactions in real time. For example, we can immobilize antibodies on the metal film and introduce their corresponding antigen in a liquid sample. As the antibody captures the antigen, the SPR angle for the interface changes, which leads to a change in measured reflectivity. Notice that in this process, no external labels are needed to generate a detection signal. Therefore, the SPR technique is entirely label-free. Another advantage of SPR is that any type of interactions can be monitored, including those between nucleic acids, antibody and antigen, protein and carbohydrate, etc., and absorption of materials on the surface as well. SPR can also provide kinetics data that can be directly used in characterizing a particular biochemical reaction. Traditionally, SPR has only one to four fluid channels for analysis of very limited number of samples at a time. The SPR imaging, or SPRI technology, takes SPR analysis a step further. It allows the entire sensor surface to be visualized through a video CCD camera so that multiple ligands can be mobilized onto the sensor surface in a microarray format, and hundreds of interactions can be monitored at the same time. This can reduce reagent use significantly and shorten overall analysis time by allowing multiplex screening in a single round. Take Salmonella and E. coli O157A7, for example. Both pathogens have been associated with multi state outbreaks with high morbidity and mortality rates. Salmonella causes the most foodborne infections in the US about a million cases a year and tremendous number of hospitalizations and deaths. E. coli 157H7, on the other hand, is known for outbreaks associated with ground meat and fresh produce. It is the single most significant shigatoxin producing E. coli serotype and can cause very severe symptoms. In order to identify potential contamination of these two pathogens in chicken, the sample is divided into two portions. For the salmonella test, it undergoes non-selective enrichment in buffer peptone water, then selective enrichment in two types of media, then plating onto two selective agars. Presumptuous colonies are then confirmed using TSI and LIA tests, and then serological and biochemical tests, a total of four to seven days. For 0157, the sample is enriched and filtered for immunomagnetic separation, followed by plating on modified rainbow arga and latex agglutination assays, and further cultured for serological, biochemical, and PCR confirmation. 
This process can also take at least four days. So overall, we're talking about a week or so to get the detection results for two pathogens in this chicken sample if they were to be conducted in parallel. An ideal alternative is for the sample to be screened using a rapid and multiplex technique, such as SPRI. It most likely will need to be enriched unselectively before the assay, but no additional culturing steps are needed. And one sample run can yield the results for both Salmonella and E. coli. Therefore, the overall screening process can be shortened and simplified. In the next few slides, I will show you some of our work towards this goal. A lot of parameters can affect the outcome of surface modification. For example, the linker molecule can determine the hydrophobicity of the surface and the spot size. If it's too hydrophilic, the spots can merge during incubation. And if it's too hydrophobic, it might be a little difficult for spotting liquid to be delivered onto the bot chip surface. So the density of self assembled by functional layer needs to be mod um, optimized. Drying should also be uh, avoided during antibody incubation since it creates non-uniformity in the spots through a physical absorption. Here I have pictures of a fairly uniformly spotted chip and a chip with spots which have partially dried during spotting. For the first one, it is easy to define the spots during SPRI and generally smaller spatial variations are found in the response signal. But the second one gives larger signal variations due to non-uniform spotting in the first place. Controlling the humidity of the array or chamber is one way to avoid drying. And glycerol could also be added to the spotting buffer to maintain the surface tension of the spots and mitigate evaporation. However, if glycerol concentration is too high, it can also clog the spotting pin and it generally needs more time for liquid delivery and cleaning. Since the SPRI runs under a flow condition, the blocking proteins also need to be covalently attached to the bile chip rather than physically absorbed, as in a lot of other immunoassays. Once the bile chip is functionalized, it can either be used right away or stored at 4 degrees Celsius um, you know, for 95% uh, humidity for later use. Here I have a picture of the SBRI system. The antibody functionalized bile chip or slide is inserted into the flow cell sealed with a hexagonal gasket. The sample is injected through a six-way valve and delivered to the interaction cell by a flow of running buffer controlled by a pump. The optical system consists of monochromatic polarized light from a laser, which is directed towards the functionalized gold surface through a high refractive index prism. The reflected light is captured by a CCD camera where it collects the output signal as variations in reflectivity. Data is recorded as intensity variation of the reflected light at a fixed angle for each region of interest selected. A digital image is produced in real time together with the sensor grams. I'll use the detection of salmonella as an example to illustrate optimization of an SPRI assay for bacteria. First, we evaluated the effect of spotting buffer pH on antibody mobilization and SPRI signal of uh, salmonella. We found that a lower pH of 4.6 increased the cross-linking efficiency of the antibody on the self-assembled monolayer of mechaptal undecanoic acid as can be seen in the bile chip image after antibody mobilization. Meanwhile, the antibody activity is not significantly impacted. Since SPRI intensity after salmonella injection is still highest at this pH. Antibody concentration is another factor to optimize. In this case, higher antibody concentration leads to higher SPRI response for the target salmonella species. However, when the antibody concentration is too high, 
after it has been spotted onto the biochip, it may smear into adjacent areas during rinsing. Also, a higher concentration may reduce the degree of freedom of the antibody and make it less accessible to the binding sites on the target analyte. So an optimal antibody concentration should be sufficient to ensure uh, successful immobilization as well as signal intensity, but within the limit to avoid any of the negative effects. In this case, 250 micrograms per mil during spotting was found sufficient. However, in later experiments, we found one milligram per mil yielded better results for that particular batch of the antibody. The specificity of an SPRI assay relies largely on the uh, ligand itself. With proper blocking, SPRI provides excellent specificity against non-target species. We tested six non-salmonella species, and none of them gave false positive signal. Most of the salmonella serotypes could be easily detected, as can be seen in their positive final reflectivity variations. Since the antibody was uh, selected using three salmonella serotypes, Inaridides, Heidelberg, and Typhimurium, it was not surprising that it had higher affinity towards these three serotypes and weaker responses against other serotypes. We also evaluated the influence of flow rate on the SPRI detection limit of salmonella. As flow rate decreased from 100 to 5 microliters per minute, the final signal intensity increased, and the lower detection limit was lowered by two orders of magnitude from 10 to the 8 CFU per mil to about 10 to the 6 CFU per mil. However, the analysis time for each sample was increased dramatically. At 100 microliters per minute, it took only five minutes for each sample, but at five microliters per minute, it took an hour and a half for just one sample, and the inactive time, which is the time for the injected sample to travel through the dead volume to reach the interaction cell, is 10 minutes. This clearly is not very efficient from a practical viewpoint. What was more interesting was that the SPRI signal would continue to increase even after the sample had already passed through the interaction cell. So dissociation phase wasn't really dissociation, but rather continued association from already captured cells. Keep in mind, a bacterial cell is hundreds of times larger in size compared to small molecules or macromolecules. And it is also multivalent. And sometimes the surface proteins on the cell can drift on the cell membrane. This makes cell analysis very complicated. Here we had a conflict between fast flow rates and slow diffusion of the cells and or the antibody binding modes. It seemed the faster the flow rate, the larger the deviation from equilibrium by the end of analysis. In other words, there was a trade-off between assay duration and signal intensity. So we tried another strategy. Instead of maintaining a constant flow, we injected the samples at a relatively high flow rate. Then we paused the flow after the sample had filled the entire interaction cell for about 15 to 25 minutes. The flow was resumed to the initial injection rate and signal was collected after the sample had depleted from the interaction cell. This enabled the signal to reach a nearly plateau, but within a reasonable amount of time, we were able to get much higher signal intensity and continuous flow at the same flow rates. From a practical standpoint, if the sole concern is to obtain a positive versus negative result, the pulse flow can be resumed as soon as target signal exceeds a certain threshold and a significant amount of time can be saved and more samples can be analyzed. The limit of detection under stop flow conditions was compared using various analysis cutoff times. The LOD for a 28 minutes total analysis time was 2.1 times 10 to the 6 CFU per mil, but really it didn't change much after 20 minutes. This indicates that the SPRI signal could reach a fairly stable level between 15 to 20 minutes. And extending the assay time didn't really add more benefit to the detection. 
Also, the samples could be sent in at higher speeds, say 100 microliters per minute instead of 50, to save more time. Taking the assay to chicken rinse samples, we spiked salmonella into buffer peptone water, which is a gross medium used in food sampling. A typical sensogram under the stop flow scheme is shown here. Before we corrected the raw sensograms with the ligand control, we saw a huge increase in reflectivity at all ligand species after the sample was injected. This was due to the inherently high reflectivity of uh, buffer peptone water compared to the running buffer and deposition of the bacterial cells on all ligand types. However, as soon as the pos flow was resumed, the cells which had temporarily deposited onto the control ligands started moving and were eventually rinsed off. At the same time, salmonella cells remain attached to anti-salmonella uh, spots through antibody antigen binding. So as the baseline dropped, the positive response at anti-salmonella spots became even more pronounced. Here are the different images recorded during the pulse phase and after the sample injection. We can see a difference image with much sharper contrast on the right-hand side after the injection had completed. In chicken meat, there exist some indigenous bacterial species, and we call them background flora. These are the bacteria that don't infect humans and therefore are not considered a food safety concern, but their presence could nevertheless lead to interference to SVRI signal of our target salmonella. The residues of chicken meat in the rinse, such as soluble and insoluble proteins and fat tissues, blood cells, may also complicate the detection and inhibit the assay, or simply increase the detection baseline. So we evaluated the influence of chicken rinse matrix and its background flora on SPRI detection limit for salmonella. We enriched the chicken rinse matrix in buffer peptone water overnight and got a culture containing about 10, uh, 9 10, times 10 to the 7 CFU per mil of background flora. Then we spiked the culture with different concentrations of salmonella and injected these spike samples into SPRI to get an estimate of the uh, LODs in chicken rinse instead of clean running buffer. We found that the new LOD was 4 times 10 to the 6 CFU per mil, which was only marginally higher than the LOD in running buffer. 2 times 10 to the 6 CFU per mil. This indicates that the chicken rinse sample posed only minor interference, if any, to target detection. Here are the SPRI difference images after injection of different concentrations of salmonella. Undoubtedly, even though the detection limit was not quite effective by complex sample matrices, it was still rather high from a regulatory standpoint. A single salmonella cell must be detected from 325 grams of sample. So at current stage, it is still unrealistic to achieve this ultra-low detection limit using SPR within 20 minutes without any sample enrichment. But we can circumvent this obstacle by including a non-selective enrichment step prior to SPRI. We spiked chicken rinse with 6.8 to 6.8 times 10 to the 7 CFU per mil of salmonella, and then culture these samples in buffer peptone water overnight. The SPRI results suggested that at all initial spiking levels, salmonella grew to detectable concentrations in the presence of competitive background microflora. These are the corresponding difference images showing the visualized results of the artificially contaminated chicken rinse samples. In food pathogen screening, the biggest potential of SPRI lies in its ability to monitor multiple pathogens simultaneously. This way, we save time and resources by simplifying the tests. In this second example, we tested both Salmonella and E. coli 0157H7 on the same biochip. We immobilized both antibodies and injected individual bacteria as uh, well as their mixture. The results showed very good specificity and robust reporting of either or both pathogens from a single run. The detection limits in the running buffer were between 1.5 and 2.5 times 10 to the fifth CFU per mil for a salmonella, and 5.8 to 7.4 times 10 to the fifth for a 157. 
The final signal intensity between O157 and anti-E. coli was lower compared to salmonella and its antibody. Besides, opposite to the salmonella case, a lower concentration of anti-E. coli appeared to yield more intense signals. This shows it is preferred to use antibodies with, with similar genetics character, characteristics so as to make signal analysis and ligand regeneration easier. In the chicken rinse matrix, the detection limits for both salmonella and E. coli were slightly higher than those in the running buffalo, much like the case in singleplex detection of salmonella. We spiked salmonella and E. coli at roughly the same concentrations into the same samples and enriched these samples overnight in buffer peptone water. They were detected at as low as 1 CFU per mole for salmonella and 2 CFU per mole for O157. We also noticed that when either of the pathogens dominated the initial sample, the growth of the other pathogen would be inhibited. This is reflected as a decrease in the SPRI signal of the other pathogen, as we can see in sample number eight and number nine. Uh, these are the different images corresponding to the SPRI intensity at the end of each sample injection. Since the signal intensity of O157 was generally lower than that of uh, Salmonella, especially when at low initial O157 concentrations, it was sometimes difficult to determine the results just by visually examining these different images. This is when the actual reflectivity data needed to be reviewed. So to summarize today's webinar, we have shown that SPRI could be used in simultaneous screening of bacterial targets using their specific antibodies. The detection limits for Salmonella and O157, H7, in the PBS buffer were in the 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th CFU per mil range, which still leaves some room for future improvements. But the detection limits in complex chicken rinse samples were very close to those in PBS. This means SVRI can perform as effectively in minimally pre uh, prepared samples as in simple buffers and can save quite a lot of time spent in preparing samples, as is often the case in other rapid methods. Therefore, with an overnight enrichment step, Salmonella and E. coli O157 H7 could be detected from chicken rinse at less than 10 CFU per mil simultaneously. Of course, the data we have shown here are from their early application studies, and much more optimization is still needed to achieve a universal flu condition for all ligand target interactions involved in any multiplex detection applications especially as the number of targets increases. And as I have mentioned earlier, the detection limit for bacteria is rather high at current stage, so enrichment is needed for low-level pathogen detection. These are some of the key challenges in SPRI pathogen detection, but will also provide new opportunities in future research. And finally, we would like to thank the members of our group, Dr. Nazarin Banel, Dr. Matthew Eady and Ray Camp, and Dr. Marinelle Sandros and Dr. Fatima Hipti from Horiba Scientific for their assistance in this research. Thank you very much for your attention.